Welcome and take a seat, please. We've got a very busy evening and we have to have at it. So if you could just be seated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please be seated. Let me just encourage you to sit down if you could. I'm uh, Jose Feliciano, all right? And I'm the chairman of the Hispanic Roundtable and I'm delighted to welcome all of you. The Roundtable is the, one of the co-hosts here. We're delighted that you are all present. We're happy to uh, co-host with the uh, TAG, which is the Transition Advisory Group. And we are very pleased that uh, some of its leadership, some of its key leadership is present with us. Uh, and two of those people are, are here, one of whom will lead the first part of our program. And that first part of the program relates to a, a substantive discussion of the county, uh, the new county government, and I know you're going to find that interesting. Thereafter, uh, we will then go into our candidates forum, and then finally, there af after that, we're going to discuss a number of Hispanic issues, including the, the uh, bilingual ballot. So, uh, Andres Gonzalez is, uh, I think he is the chair of the county, of the public engagement group, and I just want to recognize Andres for putting this thing together. Andres, if you could just stand up. And I'm going to turn the program over, the first part of it, uh, to uh, Randy McShepard. Randy is a very good friend of the Hispanic community, let me just tell you that. He is the uh, founder of Policy Group, and, he, and is, uh, when he does have a little bit of time, he works for RPM. Uh, and they're wondering how much time you're spending there lately. Yes, yeah. Uh, in any event, Randy is a member of the executive committee of TAG, and he will take it from here as we do the first part of our program, the substantive discussion of the new proposed county government. Randy. Clearly, I'm not Randy, but I just want to ask a critical question. If you only speak Spanish, uh, or you are limited English proficient, if you can let us know, so uh, we will ask you to move to the right-hand side of the, um, of the audience here and the, towards the back, and we'll be providing interpretation. Para aquellos de ustedes que no hablan inglés proficientemente, nosotros podemos ofrecer esta interpretación esta noche. Así que lo que le estamos pidiendo es que usted se identifique, y si se puede ir aquí a la esquina atrás, a mano derecha, nosotros le proveemos la interpretación según eh, la presentación continúe aquí. ¿Ok? Muchas gracias. Randy? Well, good evening. Uh, my name, as you heard, I'm Rand Randell McShepard, and I uh, serve as a co-chair of the Public Engagement Committee. And at this time, I'd like to ask members of the Public Engagement Committee to stand. Uh, you heard that Andres Gonzalez is one. I see uh, Mary Denahan, my co-chair, Gary Katz, Dr. Jeff Brutney from Cleveland State, Debbie Dow from the county, uh, Mr. Turner. Give me your last name, your, your proper. Tarter. Tarter. Yes. I was, I, I was being formal saying William, but Bill Tarter. <laughs> and did I, did I miss anyone? But they've all worked extremely hard this year uh, conducting. Who's that? Oh, Linda Barley's back there. OK. Oh, she's waving. Thank you. Um, I think they deserve a round of applause for. Uh, My comments uh, will be very brief. Um, this is the agenda for the first portion of tonight's program. As you can see from the agendas that have been passed out, there will be kind of two separate programs. Uh, the first will be a general overview of the county transition uh, effort, and then that will be followed by, I believe, a candidate tonight uh, hosted by the Roundtable and other uh, organizations in the community. So um, we're glad that you all came out, uh, but we will briefly talk about the, the purpose of these forums. Um, we've done uh, several of these to date, and uh, we'll then talk a little bit about uh, the, have the committees actually come up that you see listed on the screen here, the Transition Advisory Group, as well as the Human Services Work Group. And then uh, Andres will lead uh, 
questions and answers uh, session uh, with those of you in the audience. So we hope that you have uh, plenty of those. We always like to start these forums out by talking about perspective. This is a very big deal. It's only once every 200 years that we reform county government. And uh, we think that for that reason, it's critical that we have community uh, participation, buy-in, discourse to talk about the implications of county reform, the importance of county reform, to, to hear your concerns, to answer your questions. And to that point, um, what do we really hope to accomplish with these? Again, you see listed here the three uh, primary uh, reasons for county forums. We, uh, I, I'll slow down, Andres, because I see uh, you're trying to interpret and I'm talking really fast. But um, we want to educate the community on the status of the county transition process. So as an example, the TAG, uh, the Transition Advisory Group, as well as the Human Services Work Group have worked extremely hard the last several months trying to figure out what their recommendations will be for the new government. So they'll give you an update. Not that their work is totally done, but they'll give you an update. Uh, then we want to entertain questions and comments. Your comments are equally important uh, as your questions. And then finally, it's important for you to know that we will take your recommendations back, or, or these uh, presenters will take your recommendations back to their work groups for further discussion and uh, consideration. So um, before we move into the presentations, uh, there's one other thing I wanted to ask, and that is uh, the, uh, if you haven't received them, did we pass those out yet? Okay, you should have received an exit survey. It's a one-page document that is very basic that really asks you to check off, and there's a hand here, I think she didn't get one, Gary, uh, there's a few hands here. Um, I, I would beg all of you to take just three minutes, certainly you could take more, but at least three minutes, it would take you no longer than two to three minutes, just to check off uh, a four or five uh, basic questions and to offer any other suggestions for how we can improve this process, let us know how we're doing, let us know how we could improve, and trust me, uh, we've gotten great feedback, and we're going to use that feedback to, to help inform this process. So I, again, thank you for making the time to come out and learn about uh, county government reform. And Oh, OK. OK, thank you for that, Dr. Brendan. He's saying that one side is in Spanish and the other side is in English. So you only need to figure, fill out one side. Uh, whatever is easiest. Uh, so uh, thank you all with that. And I think at this time, it's my great pleasure to bring up uh, my good friend Joe Nani, who is uh, one of the three transition advisory group members to kind of give an overview of the county uh, transition uh, program or effort to date. So Joe, please come up and we'll give him a round of applause. Uh, buenas tardes. Uh, mi, mi nombre es Joseph Nani y es un placer estar aquí con todos ustedes. Nací en Barranquilla, año, uh, Colombia, y viví en la Ciudad de México por casi cinco años. Y mi papá, de, mi papá es de Buenos Aires. Regresando a los Estados Unidos, viví en la calle uh, 103 y Clifton, eh, a unas cuadras de aquí donde mis padres todavía uh, residen. Eh, trabajando por el alcal alcaldía de Cuyahoga por 10 años y más recientemente he estado trabajando en el com uh, Comité de tra Transición para Cuyahoga y por esa razón estoy aquí esta tarde. That's all I can do right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is just kind of do a quick summary of kind of what's happening, what has happened, and what is happening with the Transition Advisory Group and uh, since it was formed back in uh, uh, the end of last year. OK, uh, just this slide here uh, basically says, as a reminder to everyone, back in November of uh, 2009, Obviously, the Cuyahoga, can, can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, back in uh, November of 2009, obviously, the reason why we're here is the voters overwhelmingly voted in favor of the charter. So very soon after that, the, the charter indicated, and I can go into the language later, that a transition advisory group needed to be appointed to assist with the transition process. 
Uh, the, it's important to note that the charter indicated that that needed to be done by March of 2010. Actually, uh, the commissioners, uh, it was probably like a week or a week and a half after the, the election, they appointed myself, uh, Gary Holland, who's the Director of Justice Affairs at Cuyahoga County, and Jim McCafferty, who's our, currently our county administrator. Uh, what we tried to do soon on is make sure that this was an open uh, and public process. And what we did is we opened up a website to try to get volunteers to participate and assist us because obviously uh, the three of us could not do this on our own. So that re actually resulted in about 1,400 registered volunteers through our website. And they've been participating in various ways through, uh, and, and that I can get into uh, as it relates to the work groups that we'll talk about. Um, the Transition Advisory Group, it's section 13.07, is responsible for developing recommendations for the orderly and efficient transition to the operation of county government. And, and as I said, we've entrusted that process for developing these recommendations to the community using strategic leaders and volunteers in a process that is transparent and accountable. Um, as it relates to that, as you'll see up there then, what we tried to do with, with some leaders in the community is establish an executive committee format that could kind of oversee these work groups that were very independent uh, in the way that they, they function. Um, and that executive committee's role was also to, also to guide and lead the process to achieve transformational realignment and realize efficiencies in, in government. Uh, they wanted to ensure inclu inclusion in the entire community uh, and recommend and seek support for technical assistance in consulting in strategic areas. They will also oversee the work groups that I'll be talking about to ensure adherence of timelines for work and written recommendations. And also review the overall work group recommendations and then forward to us as the transition advisory group to kind of package it up and try to get it in front of the newly elected officials so it can be used. <clears throat> um, it, there was 10 functional work groups created and four additional affiliated work, work teams called the Public Engagement Committee, Governance, Collaboration, Code of Ethics, and Campaign Finance Reform. And I, I want to stress here that the Public Engagement Committee, which is the, the group that is put on this portion of the event tonight, has really been outstanding in ensuring that the public is truly engaged and kept informed in this process. And I really want to thank the co-chairs, Randy McShepard, Mary Denahan, and also Andres Gonzalez for being a part of that, along with the many other folks that Randy had introduced earlier. Um, important note, as of today, there's actually been over 320 public meetings that have taken place throughout all the work groups, and that's incredibly impressive to try to make it with a process that we can get uh, all the public involved and engaged in in different ways. This is the, the structure that, that was created early on just to try to make some sense of it all. As, as we said, the three people that were appointed to the transition advisory group could not have done this on their own. So what we did is I, I talked about the transition executive committee. We tried to divide some different <clears throat> um, work groups uh, as it relates to the county functions that exist that currently today. And you can see boards and commissions county council planning, economic development, finance and administration, human capital and quality places, human resources, human services, IT, justice affairs, and procurement and public works. Uh, one thing I want to say about these work groups is, in terms of inclusion, what we tried to do when we were thinking about how, how, to, how to organize these and structure these, obviously we wanted to make sure that there was a, a person that was really knowledgeable in the county to work on these. But we also thought it was very important to have external support and, and vision to assist with that. So in, uh, after, actually almost all of these work groups, what you have is a, a county employee that's a co-chair and then a private sector individual that's a co-chair. As an example, in the human resources a work group, you've got the current director of HR for the county and the head of HR for Key Bank. And, and it's really been a neat process where both sides have really come together and learned how each other work because obviously there's limitations in government that the private sector people don't understand but there's also a lot that public sector folks can learn from the private sector uh, people involved so I, I really think that that was a, a great way to do it and, and we've seen a lot of good uh, progress come out of that. Uh, 
Okay, this, this is uh, what I wanted to do is just provide uh, a timeline for mostly kind of where we are today and, and where we're going to be through the end of the year. Um, really, a lot of the work that's hap that has happened with the work groups is winding down. Though we're getting really close, a lot of the work groups are submitting their final recommendations to the executive committee, and then they'll be filtered up to us. So over the course of the next three weeks or so, there's going to be presentations to the executive committee, and then that, that work will then be uh, sent over to us. I, I don't necessarily want to go through all of this, but one, one thing that we've tried to do throughout this process is also make sure that the candidates were as informed as much as possible as it relates to what we're doing and what, what happens at the county. On September 21st, we're holding our sex, second candidate information session, which will be after the uh, September 7th primary, which will um, be more focused for the candidates on the actual work of the transition um, process. Um, and the rest of the dates you will see there. The, the, the other thing as it relates to the, the transition advisory group itself, one of the things we've been focusing on uh, as a group is, which is slightly different from the work groups, is we're very, very concerned and want to make sure that we have some real life expectations for what happens on day one. We're talking about, we're talk, calling them kind of the day one turnkey needs that both the county executive and, and the council need to have in place just for government to function in a basic way. And, and it sounds very simple, but it's, there's a lot of complex things that need to be decided and recommended right then and there so that we can start um, explaining to the candidates on the day after the November election those important things that they need to know. Um, this, this handout is also available to, uh, in the back of the room, I think it was handed out. It will also be on the county transition website. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, as, as it relates to the website and it relates to the public component and, and aspect of what we've been doing, I really highly recommend that folks that, uh, go to the website if um, they do feel that they need additional information on this process. Every single work group is, every single work group is um, providing real-time minutes and, and agendas and everything else that are out there. Um, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, um, and we have numerous public meetings that, that are always listed on the website. I hope I didn't rush too long. Can't hear you. I'm sorry. Well, I, I'm almost done. I wish you would have told me that earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, again, I just want to stress that the, the, the website is a great place to get information on this process. Um, Please visit that site, get on Facebook, get on Twitter, and you'll get all the information that real time as it relates to this process. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Rick. Rick Warner, you're on stage here. Speak loudly. Buenas tardes. That's all that I can do right now. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Rick Werner from the uh, County Office of Health and Human Services. Um, there are many of my colleagues from Human Services here. We appreciate the chance to um, make a quick presentation on the process that we've used to go through uh, the transition planning promise. Pro um, just, uh, this is my, yeah. just show me, okay. Um, just a, a couple of minutes about the process that we've used to go through the transition planning process. Um, and for the candidates in the room, this is a uh, repeat, uh, at least in large part, of the materials that we provided out of Tri-C um, about a month ago. But we, I wanted to bring everybody up to date on the process that we've used thus far, and then a quick look at our recommendations. Um, for those of you who have taken the time to read the charter, as I know all the candidates have, um, there is relatively little in, in the uh, um, charter specifically about human service, services other than there will be a Department of Human Services, uh, the director of which will be appointed by the county executive, um, and then that person uh, working for the county executive will um, appoint other officers. As many of you know, we have a huge human services department at the county, and so 
our job, we felt, as the transition um, working group on human services was to try to put some flesh on the bones, not so much on the structure, but as to the kinds of issues that we expect that the executive and the new county council will be looking at as, as they take office next year. Um, th there's a couple of slides, and I know this is on the handout that you have, so I'm just going to zoom through some of these. These are the, as many of you may know, we are essentially a creature of state law for the function of providing human services in the county. So many of the programs, probably most of the programs that you're familiar with, Medicaid, food stamps, child care, uh, child welfare services, adult protective services, are all mandates that are put on the county by the state of Ohio and the federal government. We're in charge with implementing it, but many of the um, rules and regulations that we must follow as part of that are set by the feds in the state. I, I won't go, I just wanted you to have a sense of the structure. This is the existing structure with the Board of County Commissioners at the top, Jim McCafferty, the County Administrator, and then the office that I'm in, the Office of Health and Human Services. The departments on the left in green are the mandated um, departments that we must have that provide the services that are mandated to us by the feds in the state. On the right hand side though are many of the more significant things, I don't want to say more, many significant things that the community and the commissioners have made a decision on that we should use our resources for in order to make sure uh, that we are serving the populations that we need to serve in Cuyahoga County. So as an example, we have the system of care in there, the Office of Early Childhood, Health Policy, Homeless Services, and the Fatherhood Initiative. I might also add that although it doesn't show up on this um, chart, we also have a very active reentry office that's headed by Luis Vasquez, um, who has worked in between um, justice affairs and human services to make sure that we're serving the reentry population um, that is particularly significant in Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. Uh, a little bit more about this is just how the office that I'm in is structured. The current, uh, I wanted you just to have a sense of the current service numbers and the budget size of the departments that are the, this, uh, the most significant service departments at the county. These are numbers as of the late spring. I, I say this, I put this up here as much as anything else to remind everybody and we have to remind ourselves that we are seeing increases in caseloads across the board at CESA, at Employment and Family Services, more recently at the Department of Children and Family Services, and we are providing service um, with many fewer staff than we had two or three years ago. We have seen a significant decrease in the funding that we've gotten from the feds in the state and frankly our own local funding. And so as an example, two or three years ago, the Department of Children and Family Services, which is the one on top, had almost 1,200 people. It's now in the mid 800s. The Department of Employment and Family Services had well over 1,000 folks and they're down now into the 700s. That makes the provision of service that all of us um, in the community rely upon take a little bit longer um, than it has in the past. If you could read this slide, um, it would show you the sources and uses of the two human service levy campaigns that fund much of what we do uh, at the county. I think perhaps the biggest gift that, that the Cuyahoga County voters could give to the new government coming into um, effect in January was to pass the Health and Human Services last May. So first I want, I want to thank everybody in the room who worked on that campaign, in particular all the candidates um, who were running for office uh, during the primary season when they were out and about for the county um, uh, elected offices, even though they weren't yet on the ballot, were very much speaking up uh, for the levy and we very much appreciate that. Had that levy not passed, the new government in January would have faced an almost $90 million hole in their budget. And the importance of these dollars, the two levies together generate almost $250 million. That is a, obviously a significant amount of money, but what it also does, in addition to having those resources in the community, it leverages well over four to five hundred million dollars of federal and state funding that flows in. So this is the base funding, if, if, you, if you want to think about it the way, or the local match for much of what we do. It also provides an enormous amount of, of all of the funding for important local initiatives like reentry, like early childhood, other things that the, as a community we've decided to work on. Much of the flexible funding for that comes from the human service levies. This is the um, charter that we were given as we began our human service transition planning process. And essentially it asked us to make a series of um, recommendations on both priorities as well as structure um, so that the new county government would have the benefit of those recommendations as they took office. 
Shortly after we started to meet, and we had well over 300 people sign up to be part of the human services planning process um, as it got started late last spring, um, we very quickly decided that, frankly, we felt that it would not be a good use of all the folks of the volunteers' time to try to work on structural issues. Obviously, the new county executive, um, in consultation with the county council, will decide how he or she wants to structure uh, human services. And so we didn't want to spend a whole lot of time um, on that issue. And, and frankly, because many of the people around the table uh, were, like me, county employees, frankly, having us draw an org chart um, would not have been, I don't think, that useful for the new incoming government. So we quickly decided to move and work on issues of, of priorities within the Human Services Department, um, excluding the uh, actual structure, although we have some recommendations about considerations that should be taken into account um, when uh, the new government takes over. Um, as Joe mentioned, there were, we, John Magala and I, John is my co-chair on the Human Services Planning process. Um, he is the executive director of the Center for Community Solutions, and in fact, actually, he is running our last meeting this week, uh, tonight at the um, Adams Board in order to get consensus on our recommendations so that we can pass them along to the Transition Executive Committee. Um, but essentially, this was the group that worked with us. Above us is are the group that is Gary Holland, um, who's with us tonight, and Joe Nani and Jim McCafferty. Um, I won't read every name on the list. Um, we just wanted to give you a sense of the bro broad range of folks from the community who were involved with the human services transition process. We had a small group that we called the work group, who were the folks who pretty much came every couple of weeks to help us pull together our recommendations. And th these were this would be essentially um, our executive committee if we had had one. We also had two subgroups of the executive committee who worked on specific issues. One was a um, uh, a coalition of funders, both private, philanthropic, the state, United Way. This was co-chaired by Bill Danahan from the Adams Board and Denise Zeman uh, from the St. Luke's Foundation. Their job was to um, think through the, prior, the funding priorities that all the private philanthropies and government um, had and to try to make recommendations uh, to the full work group on what they thought funders collectively should focus on. We also had a provider group um, uh, focus group as well. Um, as many of you may know, the county does business with scores, if not hundreds, of human service agencies throughout the community, mostly nonprofit. Um, and there are many challenges, as, as anybody in the room will know who is part of one of those organizations, sometimes in working with the county. We're, we are at times a clunky bureaucracy, um, and we wanted to make sure that we gave voice to uh, the providers in this process so that they could suggest uh, both procedural and process as well as programmatic ideas for us um, as we went through the transition process. So this group, uh, you will see when we get to the recommendations, came up with some ideas about how we should approach working with providers. I should also say, importantly, that we tried to make sure in this group that we had a range of providers, so it wasn't just child welfare providers or juvenile justice service providers or senior service providers or employment and training providers. We wanted to make sure that we had a, a, a range that, re that reflected the diversity of the kinds of organizations that the county works with. Um, this, is, this is our timeline, and as Joe mentioned, we owe our recommendations to the Transition Executive Committee um, next week, and that's the, that is the meeting that's going on right now at the Adams Board to finish those up. I have one other, power, I have a second PowerPoint, Mr. Technician, that I, I just want to go through very quickly. Um, I didn't want to bring you all uh, 42 pages of the actual recommendations that are still in draft form, and I, I do want to say, although we did not stamp on the top of this sheet, draft, these are in fact draft um, presentations, it looks like this. Um, I'm not going to go through these one by one, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the kinds of issues that we grappled with starting from um, the late spring up and through, that's it, thank you very much, um, through the summer. The other thing that I want to say, as part of our um, process that led to this set of recommendations, um, we conducted, in addition to our regular uh, work group meetings, we did 22 meetings in each 
to each and each of the 11 county council districts to try to take input from folks on what they thought the human service priorities should be. And so this work and the recommendations that you will see as candidates when they come out in a couple of weeks um, and as the community reflect not only the folks who were listed on the pr previous slides, but also the input we got from the community across the entire county. Um, recommendation number one was just a focus on the on the consumer and although that is that sounds relatively simple in fact all of our systems serve individuals and we need to make sure collectively as an organization and individually within each organization that we re remain focused on the needs of the consumers that we serve one important thing that i think will affect the county executive and the county council and the community as the new government takes over is the ability for all of the various systems within human services to communicate with each other. Part of the issues that many of you, you have seen have been raised um, over the last couple of months about specific cases of the Department of Children and Family Services have not been for lack of good social work at DCFS or lack of good work at the juvenile court um, or within law enforcement agencies, but sometimes it is a matter of communications. We have uh, many IT systems that are mandated on us by the federal and state governments. Oftentimes they don't speak to each other, and so sharing information becomes a real challenge, and we're hoping that the new government will um, work with the state and the federal government using their political capital to try to get some relief for us locally um, on harmonizing these IT systems. It sounds, I know, very technical, but it has an enormous, significant day-to-day um, -day, um, uh, impact. Um, the second uh, recommendation was that the human services community within Cuyahoga County establish a um, strategic plan. I have been in, in my job as the um, Deputy County Administrator for Health and Human Services for uh, seven or eight years now. My feeling was always that the job of the Office of Health and Human Services was to help every other individual system, whether it was a county system or one of our partners like Metro Health or the Adams Board, to implement their strategic plan. But we got a whole, and almost from day one in, in this transition planning process, uh, we got a lot of input from all the folks involved with us that they believe that the county needs an overall strategic plan uh, for human services under which each of those systems uh, strategic plan could be implemented. Um, we did, in order to make sure that we stayed somewhat true to the charge that we were given by the Transition Executive Committee, um, you will see a set of principles that we think the new county executive should take into account when he or she um, begins to work on the organization of human services. Um, and again, they're, I think they're fairly um, self-explanatory. Um, the other uh, piece that, we, that, was, that came up many times in our discussions was the need for regular uh, informal and formal communication between all of the systems that serve families and individuals in the community. So that's the court system, that's uh, the public education system, police, um, all the social service agencies, the Adams Board Metro Health, as well as the county departments and the Department of Developmental Disabilities, or the DD system. So we believe um, in these recommendations that we need to see a more formalized communication system among all of these systems. Um, we also believe that there needs to be very good communication within the county government now that there will be a, a legislative body and an executive body. And in that regard, we're, we're recommending um, that the county executive appoint um, a specific person uh, from the Human Services Department to be a liaison to the county council. And we also believe that the uh, county council should establish a human services committee so that it can productively and efficiently uh, consider issues uh, facing the human services world. Um, we probably should have put this as number one, but I guess the, the other important aspect of the job for the county council, and I guess in particular here the county executive, is being the cheerleader and fundraiser for the human service levies. Many of you may know that Commissioner Hagan, in both of his careers as county commissioner um, over 20 years, has been the single largest uh, con um, fundraiser for the health and human service levies. The other commissioners have been very supportive and have, and have helped him, but frankly, it's not in his job description, nor is it in the job description um, of the county executive in the charter, but raising the half a million dollars every two years that we need to pass the levy and then rallying uh, the community around the human service levy is an extremely important part of the executive's job as well as county council. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we made that point in our recommendations. 
Um, we also realize that there's a lot of things that we can't solve in Cuyahoga County alone. We need the cooperation and sometimes relief from the state legislature and occasionally even in Washington, D.C. So we're, we are arguing for a very strong intergovernmental advocacy. Um, we also realize that human services does not exist alone within the, the county structure and frankly within the community. And so we want to see very direct connections between what the, the work of the human services department in helping families be stable and stay stable and get the kind of skills that they need and then the economic development structure of the county and of the community to make sure that as the human services world assists families in getting ready to go to work or staying in the workforce or bettering their place in the workforce, um, that they have a place in the, in the economic development plans of the county and the community. We also realize, and this came out of the contract provider uh, group, that we just need to work better to be more understanding of those that we do business with, both in our procurement process, our payments, pro our payments processing um, process, our, our, our check writing process, and all the other pieces that make for a good relationship between uh, business partners. We also recognize, I guess, as a pushback to the, or maybe not a pushback, but uh, the, the county's interest in working with uh, providers is to make sure that we're focused on outcomes. It's not just a matter of counting the number of people or families that are served, but frankly, we need to be even more focused than we have been on outcomes. And you'll all be happy. I believe this is the last one. Whoops. If it were bigger, what it would say is that um, the, the uh, funders group within our uh, working group made sure um, to, to recognize the importance of public-private partnerships. Um, many of the things that Cuyahoga County is known for over the last five or ten years, most, spe most specifically our early childhood um, initiative now called Invest in Children, was really accomplished because private funders and private organizations teamed up with the county to create something that had not been created before. We've done the same thing more recently in, in, in a system of care process that we've gotten started. I think we've started that very um, successfully in the fatherhood initiative as well as reentry. But it, it is tr trying to make sure that the relationship between private funders, private providers, and the county is as healthy as it can be uh, to ensure that we're reaching out and uh, serving the populations that need to be served without um, duplicating. Um, services or funding for that matter. The, the one thing that I think this was maybe the most instructive for somebody who's worked in the Human Services Department now for a while was just the reminder from the private funders in the community um, that private philanthropy cannot be expected to step in um, where the where county or public funding ends. And so one of the things that obviously will be a charge for the new government is working on the state budget that's coming up, which to, uh, to everybody who is expert in it, it looks like it's going to be a very, very difficult um, budget. And I think that will make the job of the executive um, and the county council very challenging in their first year because I would expect that we are going to see significant cuts from Columbus starting July 1st, 2011 for the next two-year uh, biennial budget process. I don't want to end on a, on a low note, so let me just say that the opportunity to do the uh, human services transition process has been significantly positive. Lots of folks have gotten re-engaged with the human services world, again, both public and private, and we hope as the new government takes over in January that we can take some of the energy that's been generated through the transition process and, and use that to assist the new government in uh, taking office. I appreciate the chance to be here. Uh, I will stay. I know we've got to get onto the candidate form, so I will be in the back if anybody has specific questions. Oh, we, I'm sorry, we're staying here? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, Joe, for providing us um, great presentations, great information about the um, county transition. At this time, we're going to do a, our Q&A session, which is part of all of our forums. But before we start, we want to actually just read some of the uh, ground rules that uh, we want everyone to abide by uh, for the forum. And again, we're going to ask both uh, Joe and Rick if you can come forward and sit uh, here in the front. I will make sure that you will have a microphone here to um, answer the questions. And we're going to have two of our members, or one of our members, Gary, walking around with the uh, microphones to uh, capture your questions. We're also going to have a timekeeper. Um, so please state your name before commenting tonight. There's a two-minute limit per person. And trust me, we're going to keep it, keep it to uh, the two-minute 
because uh, we want to make sure that we can get as, as, um, as many of you that uh, might want to inquire or um, get some more information to get that uh, tonight. Everyone has an opportunity to speak before anyone takes a second turn. So we're going to go first uh, through uh, the first round, and then if we have second round, we'll take that. Focus on the comments or questions or comments for the Transition Advisory Group. We will ask you to abstain from bringing any other question that might not be related to the uh, forum or to the subject matter tonight, please. Um, again, we want to actually answer the questions that are pertaining to the two uh, presentations that you heard tonight. And again, we have the uh, timekeeper here, um, Jeff. So he will give me the two minute sign and we want again to abide by that. So. Um, also, as we conclude this portion of the program, please make sure that you fill out the uh, surveys, either English or Spanish. We have two boxes in the back that actually Linda is holding up. Um, and make sure that you put the, um, the surveys there. We would like to capture or collect all the surveys right after this session because, again, the second portion of this uh, of tonight's uh, forum is a candidate's briefing. And so we need you to report on what you've heard in the first portion of our programming tonight, okay? So with that said, we will open it up for questions. All right, so if you can raise your hand and, get, and capture your questions. Shakira Diaz, how many people of Hispanic origin were involved in the planning process? Health and Human Services process? Yes. Okay. We, we had um, good representation from the diversity of the Cuyahoga County community. I, Ma'am, I can't tell you exactly how many. I, in my list of names here, I'd be happy to go through and highlight them for you, and I could share them with you um, after the meeting, if that, if that would be okay. I mean, we tried as hard as we could to reach out to all of the affected stakeholders and constituency organizations. But to some degree, we had to rely on those who were willing to spend a great deal of time with us over the spring and the summer in order to do that. So it was folks who d decided that they thought it was important enough to be engaged with us for the whole process. But I think we did have a good um, cross-section of the community. Patty Gascoigne, candidate for County Council District 3. Um, Rick, I'm just um, wanting more clarification and explanation on what the funders focus group was for. Is this, um, did they prioritize where private funding should go? I know that some of the people that were represented in that group um, do work with collaborative from not just public funds, but private funds also for the work that they do, like Ruth Gillette, for example, with the homeless services? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the question was, um, uh, what was the purpose or the charge to the, uh, uh, the funders focus group? I, I think we were, as much as anything, uh, uh, trying to get a dialogue between all of the funders going on priorities. So it was not specifically that we're gonna fund early childhood as opposed to uh, after school programs for high school kids. It was more to um, establish lines of communication and a commitment for discussions after the new government takes over to try to align as much as possible um, the, the funding process. One thing that I did mention when I was going through the, the process is um, there was also strong feeling within our larger group um, that we should have some kind of social services advisory board, which is akin to the one that they have in Summit County, which also has a county executive and county council form of government. And one of the um, things that I know has happened on there with a much smaller philanthropic community is that now proposals for funding in major areas need to go to the social services advisory board to be signed off on before a, 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 a specific philanthropy or the United Way would consider funding it. We, had, we didn't get to that level of detail in these discussions, but I think there was a realization that with shrinking resources on both the public side and on the foundation side, that there needed to be much more discussions and planning going forward in order to make sure we were in, everybody was investing their dollars as, as uh, efficiently as they could.
like any good bureaucrat, we've uh, silenced them. So that's a. <laughs> I have a question for you, uh, Greg. I spoke too soon. Uh, regarding the uh, clearly your presentation um, for the health and human services, and knowing that we have um, clearly our community uh, benefits uh, largely from that specific um, arm of the county, how do you foresee this new county government, and especially the health and human services debt restructure? to allow or to partner with our nonprofits to provide an infused dollars that could literally uh, clearly go and affect some change, positive change in our community. And again, also uh, those individuals uh, who are the recipients as well. So the nonprofits as well as the community members. I, I think I'm gonna go one level up of, before I answer your specific question. One of the, one of the discussions that we had in, in much of our early planning process was how to um, begin to approach a county council that had specific districts as opposed to the existing three county commissioners who serve at large across the entire uh, community. And you know we know that there are needs in certain parts of Cuyahoga County that exceed those in others. And so I think there was, first of all, very much a focus you'll see in the recommendations that the money follow the need. So if there's less need in Westlake and Solon, there will be less human service resources out there. Having said that, though, many of the organizations that serve both the Hispanic community and, and other um, populations are, are, you know, exist where the bulk of that of the population lives. And so I think that that uh, what you'll see woven throughout this, I hope, is a continued commitment to work with the community to identify the needs and to try to make sure that our services are as thoughtfully and efficiently um, um, performed as possible. We are in a very challenging economic situation. I mean, one of the challenges that the, the commissioners have been faced with over the last couple of years is how to keep our neighborhood service centers, which serve populations in a more efficient manner because they're not all, they don't have to come downtown for service all the time. We've been struggling, frankly, to keep those open. So I think we need to have a continued dialogue with all the community, both specific and important parts like the Hispanic community, but the larger community about how to prioritize going forward and what, where are we willing to see cuts made in order to make sure that we keep the critical safety net in place. And I, I don't see that as a, is affecting just one population that we serve. I think it, I think it um, affects everybody, but we all sort of need to be at the table to work out those kinds of issues because we're all probably gonna have to give up a little bit in a very difficult envi uh, economic environment. Hi, my name is Gil Cody. I uh, got a question. You mentioned uh, about the, the sharing of information or the, the, I guess, the interoperability and sharing and communication of, of, of information. Thus, new IT structures will be put in place to, uh, I guess, to that point, share with me how that's going to be funded. Typically, within organizations outside of your, your fixed cost of, 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 of labor and FTE hours, IT is one of your biggest expense lines. So just give me an idea of how that's going to be funded. I knew that was probably something I shouldn't mention because I, I, don't, I, I can only, uh, only know a little bit about this. I, I will say most of the systems, sir, that I was referring to are state mandated systems that we must use. So the data that we put into those systems of, about folks who are on Medicaid or food stamps or cash assistance or who come into the child welfare system or, or who are part of the child support enforcement agency, the, that information, once it's entered in, is essentially held by the state. We can still access it in order to provide services, but the information is essentially owned by the state of Ohio. And these systems, which they've mandated that we use, they pay for, but they don't speak to each other. So one of the things that, that we're hoping the new, the new government can help us with is to do advocacy in Columbus to loosen some of the um, uh, restrictions between sharing information. So I think it's less of a financial issue than it is a regulatory relief issue to, to ask the state to give us the ability to allow these systems or to, to adapt these systems so that a child welfare worker can communicate more easily and share information with a um, public assistance caseworker who's working with the same family, but oftentimes, unless they pick up the phone and call each other, they can't share information in any electronic way. And as our caseloads have gotten 
larger and our workforce has gotten smaller, the ability of a caseworker to spend lots of time on the phone chasing down a caseworker in another um, system has is, is really um, been limited. So I think it's less of a, um, uh, a financial issue, although there probably will be financial costs to us if we want to make adaptations to the state system. It, it will be more asking for regulatory um, flexibility from the state, which we're hoping that the new county executive and county council who will come into office with a great deal of political capital can spend some of that political capital down in Columbus on, on an issue like this. I know that that probably is not as detailed as you want, and afterwards I'd be happy to answer any further questions that you have. Uh, Don Scipioni, I'm a candidate for county executive, and I'll try and use uh, some of my four minutes to answer that question. Good afternoon, I'm Maureen D. and I work at Catholic Charities, but I also serve on the Hispanic Roundtable and on the Hispanic Alliance. And this question is for both of you because uh, what I wanted to say is that the Hispanic Alliance is an organization made up of uh, uh, 12 to 15 organizations that specifically serve the Hispanic Latino community and it was created as a formalized coalition to really maximize the efficiencies of providing social services to our community. How can organizations that are groundbreaking of this nature um, be part of this initiative in, in terms of the transition and also moving forward be uh, counted uh, in the new county reform government as a way to help uh, uh, us have sort of a uh, um, what do you call it? Visibility in the new county government. From the transition perspective that I come from, um, I, I think one of the ways is there, there's obviously still an opportunity to participate in the actual work groups that are working out in the community now. Um, there has been an amazing uh, input from folks from all over this community who have given it a, 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 an immense amount of time in that process. So that's one way. And, and to carry on into that, there are a lot of work groups that are talking about kind of what their life will be like after the January 1st start of the new government. And they do want to try to find a different way uh, to remain engaged and ensure that their work is, is, is followed up on and, and how they could be helpful to the new government in, in that capacity. So that's one way that could be helpful. Um, Maureen, I, I would also, I mean, I, one of the things that will come out of the human services um, recommendations is the recommendation for an ongoing participation by um, organizations and folks who've been involved with the transition. So I would just, any group ought to stay engaged with that process. I think the other um, factor, not, not so much human service related, but you know, when, when all of us who are working on transition recommendations turn our recommendations in next week to the executive committee and they begin to package them for, uh, for the candidates and ultimately for the newly elected officials, really the, the, in my, from my perspective, the um, uh, momentum shifts to outside organizations and community organizations to, to really take the recommendations that might come out of any of these um, uh, working groups um, and highlight the ones that they think are most significant to their particular interests or agenda or advocacy um, agenda and, and work those, uh, you know, work the candidates on those. So I, I think there's a, a real opportunity, particularly in the next couple of months, when all the folks here will be listening very closely to the input that they get from organizations and then how to stay engaged after that. It really depends on the, on the uh, organization staying engaged throughout the entire process. tonight's forum and also to Joseph Manny and Rick Warner for sharing your expertise and your leadership tonight with us. Thank you.